Hello and welcome to our Ceramics History Seminar Lecture, today by Anissa Melvoisin. She is Bard Graduate Center and Brooklyn Museum Postdoctoral Fellow in the Arts of Africa. My name is Megan Jones, and I'm Associate Professor of Art History here at Alfred in Western New York. Joining us today are the 11 Ceramics History Seminar students, along with many attendees from Alfred, as well as from 11 states and now it's four countries. Uh, I'll briefly introduce our speaker. She'll present the lecture, Limitless Lines, Meroitic Painted Ceramics. And then we'll have ample time for your questions. You can write those in the Q&A or the chat or raise your hand and you can ask it out loud. Anissa Malvoisin is a specialist in Egyptology, Nubian archeology span and museum studies. Her doctoral thesis investigates the ceramic production and trade industry during Meroitic Nubia and its potential far-reaching networks linking the Nile Valley to Iron Age West African cultures. She examines these networks by identifying artistic similarities on pottery, which she combines with piecing together the object's biography in order to better underst understand Nubian collections in North American museums. She earned her Master of Museum Studies from the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto and incorporates museum theory and practice into her academic and professional work. She has worked with collections at the Royal Ontario Museum in the Department of Arts and Culture, Global Africa, and in Ancient Egypt and Nubia, as well as in the Bioarchaeology of Nubia Expedition at Arizona State University. We're so thrilled, Anissa, for you to present today. And over to you. Thank you so much, Megan. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak um, at, as part of your wonderful class that I wish I could take something like this when I was in coursework. <laughs> um, so I'm really excited to share with you um, what I have been studying for the past couple of years, this really beautiful pottery type, and I'll just share my screen so you can see what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be talking to you about Meroitic painted pottery and kind of the con historical contextualization, contextualization of its development in Nubia and how it became what it became. So let's situate ourselves. Um, we'll be located in Egypt and Sudan today, which is in Northeast Africa. Um, and I have indicated where the extent of the Meroitic um, or the Nubian territory is. It includes Southern Egypt and Northern Sudan. It's quite small, but if you look at my little square um, on the continent here in Sudan, you can kind of see my arrows kind of uh, demarcating the borders. Um, in antiquity, Nubia's borders changed multiple times, extending to its furthest when it conquered Egypt, making the latter part of its empire. During the Meroitic period, Nubia's territory reached as south as Khartoum and as north as the Egyptian Nubian border at what we call um, a cataract. And this border is at the four, first cataract, and there are six that start at the first and go into um, the Nubian territory. So you're probably wondering what is Meroitic? Why do I keep saying the Meroitic period? Or is she going to explain herself? <laughs> so between um, circa 343 BCE to about uh, 450 CE, Nubia embarked on a new historical trajectory with the establishment of its new capital at the site of Meroe in the South, which I have also indicated on the uh, map on the top right. This period is very interesting because it's at an important turning point in history where Egypt is no longer being ruled by indigenous pharaohs and has been consumed into the Greek empire ruled by Greek elites called Ptolemies, um, founded by Ptolemy I here on the left-hand side. And this rulership lasts for around three centuries until the last ruler of Egypt, who is uh, the last to rule actually as Pharaoh. So not an indigenous Pharaoh, but still ruling with the 
the, the local conventions and traditions um, of Egyptian, indigenous Egyptians, Cleopatra VII on the right-hand side is defeated at the Battle of Actium. Her suicide, Julius Caesar's assassination, and the final invasion of the Roman Empire into Egypt marked the end of the Ptolemaic rule in Egypt. This occurred while um, the Battle of Actium was going on between Octavian and Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, which I have um, pictured here. So once this happens, the Romans take over administration of Egypt and the country is engulfed into another foreign empire. Um, this is important to situate ourselves historically to understand what's going on with the material culture of these periods. After this battle, the, peer, uh, the power change, excuse me, the power change goes to the Romans um, and Egypt becomes annexed into their empire under Octavian. Um, so this is all going on in Egypt. Um, in Nubia, they are transitioning from their former center of power to a new one. And all the while, even with the power changes in Egypt, both entities maintain commercial ties, which, all, which also affects um, the way that we understand ceramic history at this time. So I just wanted to show you here kind of um, what's happening. So meanwhile, in Nubia, the royal and elite are busy establishing this like new administration, uh, excuse me, administrative, royal and religious centers further and further south. So kind of away from that first cataract border um, and uh, establishing this new capital at Meroe, which I have pictured here. Um, and the necropolis I also have pictured here is Meroe. And these necropolis are really important to marking these uh, changes in history. So this is like a this is a new royal uh, burial ground, and it's centered at Meroe. So all of this historical contextualization is helpful for understanding the development and refinement of ceramic production in Nubia. Um, again, this is a very culturally vibrant period where Nubia is continuing to interact with various entities, expanding their political prestige within the empire, and increasingly specializing their arts. Um, I just wanted to show you the kind of extent of the Meroitic Empire on a up close map. Um, so again, at the first cataract, cataract border at Aswan at the in the north, and extends to the south here at Jebel Moya. If you can look down down here where my cursor is, um, but it's also important to visualize uh, to understand the extent of ceramic specialization and centralization at this time, because we find pieces of pottery at sites along the Nile. So I'll attempt to cover some of the materials mentioned in the reading that I suggested for today, including the specific sites that help us understand this pottery and the people a little bit better. So let's get into the pottery. Um, we're going to look at the ceramic production from the period. Um, and we're gonna focus primarily on the fineware industry, but I will mention um, some coarse wares as well. So uh, the pottery can be broadly uh, uh, divided into two groups, fine and coarse wares. Um, so as you can see this with this really beautiful vessel in the background, meroitic potteries, fine wares have a fine um, residual clay and it's usually sourced from kaolin. Um, and they're thrown to which their walls become extremely thin. So they're also called eggshell wares. And as you read, there was a simple classification system that was made by Adams that categorizes pottery families um, by specific features. And these specific eggshell wares fit into uh, his family M. And then family N are Nubian made painted and stamped pottery that are not thin and whose fabric is not as fine, but still wheel made. So throughout the presentation, I'll mention family M and family N. Just remember that family M is the eggshell, like thin fine wares, very clean clay. We, we also get much of uh, these ceramic remains from archeological contexts. So I wanted to show it's recording here on the top left-hand side um, from the excavators on the, uh, from a site report in 19, uh, from 1910. So we uh, actually get a lot of material um, or fineware material from this site called Karanog and it's a, it's a Northern Nubian site. Um, so speaking of the clays, um, 
those that were used for making pottery, there's, there's specific types for the Meroitic pottery. There's four main types with A and C having two distinctions. C is the uh, family amour, the eggshell wares, and those vessels have a fine fabric, which you can see quite nicely with the photo I've, I've shown here. You can kind of see the, the clean break. Um, there's also Nile silt being used from the alluvium of the river. That's a very popular clay source for all types of pottery typologies in Nubia, not just in Nubia, but also in Egypt. Um, then we have mixed clays and wadi clays. Um, and a wadi clay is, it comes from a wadi, which is a sort of dry ravine um, that are being used for preparation to create vessels that are definitely um, not part of family M, but found in the N wares. Common forms include plain rimmed cups with carinations that appear just above the base. Um, these are especially common for the family M eggshell wares. Some appear more squat than others, but still are fairly consistent. Um, and these carinated cups are also popular in the North. Globular or round bodied vessels are extremely common for both uh, of the families M and N. Cylindrical bottles are quite common as well for painted wares. You don't see many that are stamped if they are cylindrical. Um, they're mostly painted. Also, I wanted to show these small bottles that are highlighted on the right-hand side, which range from maybe three to four inches to 10 inches in height. Um, and they appear sometimes with one handle, but also with two, and they're almost always footed. Um, you're probably all very um, knowledgeable about metal, metal colorants, um, but I just want to show you the popular ones going into the later periods in Egypt and Nubia. There begins to be an increase in color variety used for paint slip and slips, especially and for glazes, but that's a lot later. Um, and this lasts up until the Islamic period. Um, but during the Meroitic period, we'll see how these colors look on pottery. And um, you don't really see cobalt blue, but a lot of iron red, a lot of uh, manganese black. And uh, yeah, those are the two main colors that we kind of see. Decorative treatment is vast during this period, really reflecting the ceramic uh, renaissance. Um, there's a utilization of paint, which includes colorants that vary from black, orange, and red. Um, slip is almost always applied, either colorless, red, or kind of a creamish white. Those are very popular. Vessels are often burnished to a slight sheen, but polishing is not very common. Um, incisions and impressions are incredibly common, and so are stamps, and um, I'll show you kind of the importance of stamps and how uh, the variety of stamps that we have. Um, Adams are also uh, categorized decorative styles and I won't go too um, deep into all of them, but the most important one to remember is N1A uh, fancy, the Meroitic fancy. This is like encapsulates, encapsulates most of the uh, surface treatment or decoration that we'll see today. Um, here are some examples of this fancy decorative style, distinctive representational designs such as the lotus flower, vine wreaths, the ankh, which is an icon symbolizing life um, and is also used in Egypt, um, and also satire faces. These are very common and regular. Lotus, uh, the lotus here is actually a repeating frieze element going around the cup um, on the bottom left hand side. Um, and it's the same with the jar to the left and the small cup on its right. So um, there are alternating and repeating motifs that occur when there is kind of like a central um, icon or motif like the lotus. Um, sometimes the potter will mix and match different motifs and have them alternate or have the same motif repeat. And it goes all around the body. Um, rim and collar stripes, as well as framing and separating stripes, um, also called concentric lines, are also extremely popular and are a marker for Meroitic pottery. So you can see um, almost all of these pots I've shown here have concentric lines, and these lines frame um, a central motif or frieze or repeating or alternating element. And it, it's either usually at the upper body of the vessel or the entirety of the vessel. Um, but it doesn't usually, I shouldn't say the entirety, uh, like 
from the upper body to the like the belly I guess but not usually not usually the base but sometimes there are decorations in the base it's just not as common but you'll see um, so these are excellent examples of family M, both in decoration and in vessel shape. When it's a globular body, usually the family M eggshell wares will have this type of uh, short rim attached to it um, and they're thin walls. And this 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 vessel, will, will it may look big, but it's not, it's not that big. And um, I have another slide that'll show you kind of for scale how small these are. Um, cups, bowls, jars, plates, small oil bottles, and footed jars are also popular for this family. Um, and for family N, vessels look a lot like this. They're a thicker rimmed version of the other family. Again, similar vessel shapes are common for this family. You actually don't see many cups, but more globular bodied, um, flaring rim, short necked vessels. Um, here we have some examples of uh, this kind of squat, short necked globular body jar that is so popular and the cups. Um, so the one on the left and the top right are uh, a thinner wall and the one on the bottom right is a thicker wall. But I just want to kind of show you the variety of uh, globular bodied um, uh, pots. So these jars, as I, as I said, not very big, about five, it could be five to about max 20 in diameter. These jar types are common. Um, these forms are actually reminiscent of Ptolemaic vessel forms and even forms we see in the Greek and later Roman world. Um, and then also in the Levant and West Asia um, and on the Arabian Peninsula. So it's important that we kind of know that there are local imitations of pot of pottery that is uh, dominant outside of Nubia and Egypt, but um, we know that they are local imitations as well because uh, we also know that there are imports of these same types of vessels um, coming into Egypt and in Nubia at this time. Um, these are the cups that are very popular with the eggshell wares. Um, the half crescent, with uh, or combined with the onk became very popular, but I have picture here on the right, um, especially during the apex or the heyday of uh, the Meroitic period. Um, the vessel on the left has a scaling design that is actually common in um, Chadic and other Sahelian sites to the west, which may indicate some sort of communication there. Um, but it still kind of fits into the Meroitic uh, decorative program. Again, a popular vessel form um, here, I just wanted to show you some more cups, uh, the carinated, uh, the carination just at the below the, uh, just up above the base, excuse me, um, is very, very common. Um, and the cup on the left <clears throat> actually is a good example of a repeating motif. And the cup on the right is an example of an alternating of alternating motifs. I wanted to highlight these tall neck jars. They, they were also in the reading. Um, they are now believed to be restricted to the Middle Nile, which indicates kind of a local tradition. They are thick walled, finely levigated, uh, globular bodied uh, bottles or tall, tall neck jars. Um, they depict quite Hellenistic design, but again, focused within the Meroitic artistic convention. Um, so very, a very specific approach to design. Um, I also highlighted the site of Sidinga because uh, the, this is a site where many of these tall neck jars were discovered. So that also helps us kind of create a story or create um, some type of understanding around these pots and who was making them. Okay, I'm just checking my time. Um, so uh, I'll go quickly. We'll just go into a little bit more depth to look at uh, the decorative um, surface treatment, which hold cultural, religious, and political value. So I mentioned that repeating and alternating motifs earlier are really popular. Radials are very popular, um, like we see here on this vessel, the kind of floral radial that's uh, alternating. 
Um, it's also important to remember that this potting tradition is very unique in that it blends various foreign design with local design. Here are some icons that are represented in different artistic forms, including pottery. Um, the ram's head is central to both Egyptian and Nubian religion. So here on the right-hand side, um, and especially it became a very important symbol of royalty in uh, the period previous to Meroitic Nubia, which is called Napatin. Um, so this happened right before Mary, uh, the, the capital changed this period. Um, but this symbol continued into the Meroitic period and can be found in the form of jewelry quite popularly. So in the Napatin period and the Meroitic period, the, you, you'll see that uh, they were great. The, the people were very opulent accessorizers, namely with semi-precious stones and metals like gold, silver, and bronzes. Um, and a lot of their uh, jewelry depicted the ram's head, especially if you were elite, especially if you were royal. Um, so uh, very important. The icon on the right may represent a hieroglyph that represents sa, meaning protection. And there are amulets made in this form as well. And they're visible on different materials um, like faience and not just uh, ceramic vessels. Um, but you, you see this represented. So this is a piece of faience here, but you see this represented on pottery as you saw here. Um, I just want to mention the sun disk behind the ram's head is also an important symbol as the sun is associated with a major deity um, and is also associated with divine kingship. Um, this is another example of family M with more icons. Um, the Ankh is here, represented here, um, with a representation of a, a lotus flower as a repeating motif. Um, there's also what we call the bead ball chain motif here as well. This design and also the painting style has been ascribed to what has been deemed the academic school. Um, this is a workshop of, or a group of painters that practice under uh, like say a master artist. Um, um, and they're all consistently uh, using the same techniques and they all have a technical knowledge of iconography um, to kind of recreate similar types of pottery. So despite this kind of specific workshop, the motifs still appear at other sites throughout the empire, suggesting that the potting practice may have also been centralized. Um, I really wanted to show you this cup because it has three interesting motifs with stamped and painted application. Firstly, uh, what may look like a person holding their hands up is actually most likely a sun disk in between ram's horns, which is a common motif, again, symbolizing divine kingship. Um, in the second register, a roaring cobra, also an important symbol of kingship in Egypt and in Nubia. And it's often depicted on the king's crown, um, just in the, the middle of the king's crown. Um, and then below, lotuses, which uh, is a flower native to the Nile Valley regions. They're all represented on this one cup. Um, so I thought it was a really great example of iconograph of the iconograph program represented on a pot and also mixing stamps with paint. The motif's importance as a symbol of power, um, kingship, and life is consistent in Meroitic Nubia. This snake actually has stylized onks coming out of its mouth on the left-hand side, um, which can be interpreted as speaking life or giving life combined with its symbol of power and kingship, again, connecting to divine kingship. So these, you can see that the pottery kind of is like a, not just an artistic canvas, but also a way of kind of disseminating um, political and, uh, and royal prestige. Uh, and here, I just want to show you a silver ring of a, of a roaring cobra on the right. Again, this icon represented on headdresses of the king as I mentioned earlier, and how small some of these little uh, these little jars get. <laughs> um, I wanted to also show you some Hellenistic design. It's present within uh, with the scroll designs that also mimic Ptolemaic, Ptolemaic vessels that we uh, kind of see being made in Upper, uh, excuse me, uh, southern southern Egypt. Um, 
they look sometimes similar to the Greek hadra, hydria on the left-hand side I have here, um, and many scholars compare them. Uh, here's another example of a motif on the base um, as a floral radial. So sometimes we do have the entirety of the vessel um, covered. So that's why, that's what I mentioned earlier. Sometimes we do get that. Um, you can also see that the size of this jar is quite small. Um, so the special shape is quite commonly made in this size. And that's me holding this jar. This is from the MFA Boston, which has one of the best collections of meritic pottery outside of her tomb. Impressed designs on a similar small pot here. Um, impressed designs all over the body of the vessel is very common and they can vary from incredibly elaborate to simple additions to a larger iconographical scheme or mo motif. Um, as I mentioned earlier, stamps are an important marker for meritic pottery. It's a cultural persistence that grows alongside painting um, and the combinations are specific to this period. These are just additional characteristic forms that contrast the primarily painted surface treatments of the vessels from the previous slides that we look at and also look very different from the Hellenistic designs that we saw represented um, in the previous slides. So stamping again was popular, uh, sorry about that, um, in Meroitic Nubia, especially in forms produced in and found in the South. The South has a lot more variety of stamps. I also chose vessels that displayed uh, characteristics that I found. Um, this is another story, but there's some characteristics that parallel uh, pottery that I have also seen in West Africa. Um, so part of the, again, ceramic renaissance that I was speaking of is archaism. We're looking back towards the Nubian past brought about more production of black incised wares. So these were slip pigmented and burnished and the incisions had pigments applied, um, just like a prehistoric Nubian cultural group called the C group. So they have very similar um, stylizations um, of pottery that look very similar to this. Um, so Nubians, I just want to, to kind of show this because Nubians had an extended history of expert pottery making, and it develops as exquisitely as it begins. They only kind of continue to refine their practice over time um, with only very small pockets of ceramic artistic decline. So um, I chose limitless, limitless Lines for the title of this lecture because of the incredible scale and beauty of the use of lines in the artistic practice of Meroitic potters. These not only included inspiration from the entities that the empire interacted with, but also with their own local traditions, evidence through relative consistency, even prior to the development of what pottery became during the Meroitic period. Um, so pottery was the canvas of choice for Meroitic potters, um, excuse me, for Meroitic artists um, who were in fact uh, expert crafts people in their own right. And this canvas was instrumental in disseminating, as I mentioned, religious, political, and cultural themes through iconographical programs. Um, and I chose to end with this cup because it, along with the scaling pattern that we saw earlier, um, many times previous in the slide, in the slides uh, was an interesting use of linear design that still captured the unique meritic artistic approach to decoration um, and shows us local variety in the, even in the midst of overwhelming interregional inspiration. Um, so that's all I have for today. And I think I stayed on time um, and I'm really happy to answer any questions that you may have um, to the best of my abilities. And I really hope that you enjoyed um, all the really pretty pots that I showed you today that I'm obsessed with. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Anissa. Indeed, limitless lines. <laughs> and we don't have limitless time for Q&A, but we, we do have uh, a good deal of time. And uh, we really want to make space for all of your questions. So I see a hand raised, Suzanne uh, Lear, Blyer. Uh, I will press the button and ask you to unmute. Th thank you. It's Suzanne Blier. And, um, Suzanne. and I want to begin by thanking um, the speaker for this really wonderful uh, 
talk and um, a couple of uh, questions related more generally. Will this be available, the link to this talk for others? Because I'd like to pass a copy on to one of my graduate students. Um, again, I think it was really, really terrific and did much more than simply looking at pretty pots. It was, it was well conceived. And my question is, I'm seeing relationships between the Nile Valley and the Niger in terms of uh, the, and the Niger Valley in terms of uh, the transference of forms, ideas back and forth, but particularly around textiles. It, it, and I'm wondering if, are there ways in which um, some of these ideas about archaism and endless lines and patterning figure also in textiles and in what ways does that enrich, expand, um, or otherwise engage the argument with the ceramics? That is a fabulous question, and I have read a lot of your work. <laughs> so thank you for um, your comments and your question. Um, I definitely think there is. I am a scholar that is very interdisciplinary, and I like to look at different things and different aspects to create a complete holistic story or um, um, idea or interpretation. So um, I definitely think that looking at textiles um, and kind of the transfer of ideas to see kind of what is kind of moving back and forth with different artisans um, and how they're interpreting um, ideas and uh, artistic approaches to their materials is incredibly important and and like I feel like likely. Um, a lot of the material in Egypt and Nubia actually, uh, ceramic material I should say, uh, scholars believe are um, influenced by pot, by basketry. So you'll see some, some pots, especially from the prehistoric period in Nubia, um, that look very similar to bas basketry, some of the impressions. I'm sorry about the, the noise. Um, uh, but yeah, so a lot of impressions are similar to bas basketry, the way that the impressions are uh, applied and the kind of design techniques that are applied, it kind of looks like that. So, I mean, I haven't, I haven't actually taken a look at the at the textile, but I definitely feel like that's an avenue that can be expounded upon. And, and I'm looking a lot at Nile Valley and Niger Valley um, interconnection for my um, for my thesis. So, but just 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 through pottery, um, but textiles, I think that's a really great way or another avenue to take a look at. Great, thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Dr. Blier, for your question. And you also asked if this recording would be available. It will. It will be published to the YouTube channel of Alfred University. We've got uh, several great questions coming into the Q&A, so uh, I'll read them out loud. Uh, Liz from our seminar writes, trade seemed to influence Meroitic pottery. Did Meroitic pottery influence the surrounding ceramics traditions? I think, uh, Anissa, you were um, talk mentioning earlier the... Uh, um, interchange between West Africa, Afri West African pottery traditions and those uh, East. Um, so I think this question is, is regarding that, the influence from uh, Meroitic pottery uh, to locations elsewhere. And she writes, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you for your question. <laughs> um, <clears throat> that's an excellent question. And I do not have a definite answer because I do not know at this point in my research like I don't want to say that Meroitic pottery influenced pottery that I have found similarities in West Africa West African regions I should say um because it could have also ha happened the other way or it could have also kind of had <clears throat> um like a combined influence, um, especially, excuse me, especially for, for designs that are not uh, like historically um, embedded in the local traditions of Egypt and Nubia, because some of the icons like the Roaring Cobra or the Ankh, um, this you can trace back to, to like thousands of years um, in the Nile Valley. Um, so I wouldn't say, like, if I saw, like, a Roaring Cobra or, like, an Ankh kind of designed in the same way in West African regions, that I might be inclined to say that, okay, maybe they were influenced that way. Um, but the <laughs> these designs are kind of, 
not like culturally specific. So I don't want to say one or the other influence because I don't, I haven't, decided, I haven't come to a concrete conclusion with my, with my research yet. Um, I just have, I'm, I guess at the beginning stages of seeing these similarities by looking at archeological sites. So I'm actually looking at um, the Fazan region in Libya. I'm looking at uh, Ghana, the site of Deboya. I'm looking at Jene in Mali, and I'm looking at the Nok. In the Nok regions in Nigeria. And I found some really interesting, um, and some Sahelian sites as well in Chad, as I said. Um, I've found some really interesting um, uh, like relations and similarities. And I'm, honestly, the one thing that I could kind of say that maybe the Meritic, uh, Meritic Meritic may have influenced is I found a really cool shirt from Jenny. Um, Jenny region that has a rosette that looks like the vessel on the right hand side. Um, so that is my one guiding <laughs> piece of evidence right now, <laughs> but it still hasn't, it's not conclusive. So that is my diplomatic answer. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, a, a, a great follow-up question comes from Emma Kay, also from the seminar. She writes, thanks, Anissa. The architecture of the Meroitic Empire is distinct in its geometry. <laughs> in your research, have you examined any connections between this architecture, so Meroitic Empire architecture, and the surfaces or forms of Meroitic ceramics? Another great question. Um, architecture, not so much. Um, but I will say that the lotus, I didn't include this slide. So that's very interesting that you said that you asked that, but it's still here in my presentation. So I'll find it. Um, the lotus design looks a lot like these columns that you find um, in hippo style halls. Um, this is a this is a great type of style hall at Karnak um, in Egypt, and kind of the lotus designs that you see represented on um, Meroitic pottery looks very similar. I find to kind of the lotus uh, the lotus columns um, in Egypt. So I mean that's the closest I could say off the top of my head, but I haven't actually found relations between architecture. Um, and the iconography on pottery as of yet. Okay, fantastic. That question might might have come up because we were talking the other day about uh, mud brick architecture in Western Africa and thinking about potential linkages between pots and buildings. Uh, so, so that's that's definitely on our mind in the seminar. So, and thank you, Emma. Uh, our Ceramic Art Division Head Walter McConnell asks, is there evidence of kiln sites or pottery workshops to be found on site that indicate scale of production? Another great question. Um, there was a pottery workshop that was discovered at a Southern site close to the, close to Meroe, the capital, um, that, uh, like there's there was wasters there and like broken pieces of pottery um, so it's definitely thought to be a kind of workshop ceramic workshop but still there's still some excavations going on to uh, to to find uh, kind of what the scale was and like what types of pot uh, what kind of uh, uh, I should say like how these workshops uh, functioned um, and I should have more information on that. Uh, I'm a bad scholar for that. <laughs> I should have more information on that. Um, but that's an, another interesting question because I did include these uh, kilns <laughs> um, that I removed because I didn't want to make the presentation too long. But these are not from the Meroitic period, they're later period, um, Christian period, um, this is Christian period site of Faras. And this is a very large scale ceramic workshop that's happening at a very uh, important site uh, after the Meroitic period. So uh, pottery production doesn't stop after Meroitic period collapses, it still continues. And 
we're kind of using, this is a good example of a, of a workshop operating in Egypt not long after the Meroitic period. And um, there's com com comparisons and contrasts that we can, we can pull from them. Fantastic. Another technical question from an anonymous attendee who mm -hmm. writes, thank you. Can you talk more about what is meant by paint? Is it just pigment or does it refer to slip as well? Is it yes, ever it added after firing? Good question. <laughs> it is prior to firing and yes, a slip. <laughs> Great. <laughs> that was quick. Uh, Chelsea McMaster from our seminar asks, do we have any information about who these artists and craftspeople were? Are there restrictions on who could make these pieces? So a question about the identity of the makers. Mm -hmm. um, the longstanding notion is that the makers were men. Uh, men did uh, wheel-made pottery and women did handmade pottery, but uh, I don't know if I believe that. Um, more research obviously needs to be done um, about who exactly were the potters. That's a fabulous question, um, but we do think that, the and we could kind of relatively say with relative um, certainty that they were working for the state just because that they were so standardized, these pottery, these pottery types in vessel shape, in surface treatment, in the iconographical program, and um, in scale. So Meroitic, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, the fine wares are actually, they make up a smaller um, repertoire than the, than the coarser wares. So again, they're even more exclusive. Um, so there's definitely, they're definitely like specialized uh, craftspeople that are working on these uh, on pottery types and that have special knowledge um, to kind of create these specific wares with a specific decorative approach. Um, and yeah, so we think that it's, just, it's, it's centralized. So specific workshops working um, with similar techniques, but as to exactly who, that's a little bit harder to determine. So far, I can't help asking a follow up question. And you said you sure. said that you were you were um, skeptical about the notion that it it was only men making these spots. Could you talk more about that? This is a subject that's come up quite a bit in our first few sessions during the seminar when we've uh, looked at case studies of prehistoric ceramics and the running is a run, running statement that most authorities put forth is that the first potters across the globe were likely women, the first, you know, human beings making pots. Mm -hmm. uh, but yet there are a lot of questions about how we know that, you know. Um, so could you just talk a little bit more about the issue of, of gender and the identity of makers? Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of more ascribed to um, like, who is working in what sector and who is allowed to work in what sector. So um, in ancient Egypt, for example, it, men are usually working in, men usually have these kind of positions. And we actually have um, like scene walls from tombs that depict men making pots. Um, in Nubia, not so much. But, uh, you know, I just, from my research, and please, if anybody has done any research <laughs> and has come across something that I may have missed, but um, from my research, uh, there's just not any kind of precedent or like in Nubia to kind of say that just women made pot, um, handmade wares and uh, the specialized tech, high, high technical wares that are we made with the wheel are just by men. So that's why I'm skeptical. No. <laughs> that sort of skepticism is, is what we want to hold on to, isn't it? That's <laughs> we, that's we, we challenge, uh, you know, Definitely running uh, understandings of, of ceramics history. Uh, a couple more questions from seminar students. I want to encourage you to raise your hand and I'll, I'll 
allow you to, to speak out loud or, or bring you on screen if you like. Uh, Joelle writes, the reading we did, so by the way, for everyone who isn't in the seminar, um, students read a chapter called Ceramic Industries of Meroitic Sudan by Romaine David, and that's from the Handbook of Ancient Nubia, published in 2019. Joelle writes, the reading we did mentioned that the majority of Meroitic ceramics have been excavated from cemeteries. Have there been more slash are there any current efforts to excavate ceramic production sites? So this is getting back to Walter's questions mm -hmm. from uh, a moment ago. If so, how has this shifted our understanding of this ceramic history? Uh, and then he writes, thank you so much for the presentation. So if I can add a bit to that, it seems like uh, so much of what we know about early ceramics history across the, across the globe is based on where's found in tombs, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so this is a, a great question re regarding our understanding of the objects based on their isolated, you know, um, uh, you know, identities, so to speak, coming from tombs versus um, understanding them in the context of production sites mm -hmm. uh, from the archaeological perspective. Mm -hmm. Yes, such a great question. And um, again, I should be doing um, or keeping up with the uh, new excavations that are happening, but I believe that there were there are some there's some evidence for other production centers um, in middle and uh, so sorry, I keep saying middle, upper, lower. These are specific terms, but um, like the middle of the Nile in uh, in Nubia and then northern Nubia. Um, I just cannot, and I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to say the wrong thing, but um, not off the top of my head, but um, there, there is, there's an effort to kind of uh, find the production centers, of course, um, and to kind of see what the scale of manufacture in these production centers were. Um, so there's, a, there's, a, there's active excavations happening um, and have been happening. Um, and I really can't wait for a lot of the excavation reports to come out because that will, uh, definitely change how we see things and uh, change our interpretations of what we know right now. Um, but uh, I, I guess I can't really give you a definite answer for, for that question. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Give us a lot of food for thought. Okay, a yeah. question from Spencer Cheek from the seminar. Do we have a sense of how the fine ware made it into the world? Were workshops producing for local markets? Or was a lot of the word destined for power centers like Meroe and the upper classes? Yes, so they were likely for the for power centers and for the for royal and elite. Um, scholars have uh, inter interpreted that these kind of well, one specific scholar, David Edwards, um, has a really great interpretation that these were most likely being um, exchanged through through diplomats, like diplomatic exchanges, um, <clears throat> and they were considered prestige goods, um, which kind of, well, I believe makes sense because of the iconography that we find on, the, the very specific iconography that we find on um, a lot of these, these ceramics. So they're definitely in upper classes. And then we also find um, these pots and these types of wares, especially the fine wares in uh, royal and elite tombs. So they are not uh, for the lower classes. <laughs> They're definitely being um, redistributed within the empire, but within um, kind of an elite space and as an exclusive good. Thank you. That relates to a question I was gonna ask. You showed a pot that had stamps of uh, cobras and the figure with the hands up, um, symbols of kingship you were talking about. And I was, I wanted to know, does, does that mean that that pot was likely made for royalty? Can we safely assume that? We could assume, yes. Um, again, off the top of my head, where this pot is from, but if like the, even if it wasn't, um, made for royalty the fact that it has this these this type of iconography and that it was kind of funneled through elite spaces 
um, and that the iconography is very centralized, uh, not centralized, uh, standardized within a, within a centralized uh, kind of scale of manufacture. Um, I believe that the royal and elite would know like this is like the, ki the king or the queen's uh, dissemination of their royal authority through that way which is really interesting that they're using pottery to do that. Because um, in ancient Egypt, you see that they'll do monumental building projects in order to do that with, uh, with uh, the reliefs. And that's how kind of they will show their royal authority and divine kingship to the masses and to the royal and elite. Fascinating. Uh, mm -hmm. So that gets back to to the question about the relationship between architectural structures or yeah. <laughs> monuments, uh, we can say, and and pots. Mm -hmm. uh, Cindy Mears uh, writes, "I'd love to see these kilns that you didn't include. I think you did show an image of those after she wrote this. Uh, maybe append them to the video of this Zoom that will be shared later. Um, I think I think that's done because Anissa did show that slide. So thank you, Cindy." Uh, an anonymous attendee writes, are these pots you've showed us the same pots used for everyday use for the entire population in terms of making and decoration? I think in, in the discussion just now, we've established the answer to that question, but, but please elaborate. Uh, and they write, curious if the handmade pots were used for different functions from the wheel thrown pots. Mm -hmm. um, the wheel thrown pots definitely had a specific function. Um, they were kind of coveted for, um, they were coveted as art for themselves. Like they were considered art in their own respect. Um, and definitely the handmade wares, um, were some of them, um, just not to the same scale, not to the same scale as the fine wares, not to the same scale to the, the wheel thrown family and wares that still have that same type of iconography. Um, are being kind of uh, funneled through these uh, elite spaces. The handmade wares are not held to this, or, you know, not held to the same regard. Um, I don't study handmade handmade wares uh, in quite in depth uh, as opposed to the fine wares or the wheel thrown wares, I should say. Um, but they are still very important in uh, Nubian ceramic history, and they do have different functions, but I I don't want to speak on that because I don't want to, uh, it's a little bit out of my, my purview. <laughs> um, yeah, this term fine wares, <laughs> so fine wares versus coarse wares, um, so just, just to confirm, so fine wares, means wheel thrown wares yes wheel thrown to very thin wall and also their um fabric is finely levigated and very clean okay um do we know how that term emerged calling these fine wares and what do you have any thoughts on th that terminology um well it's it's kind of it's just like a i guess a it's terminology that's used in my field for ceramics, um, both in Egypt and Nubia. Um, and Nubian, uh, Nubi, Nubian archaeology ceramicists, uh, like, yeah, we use that term. It's just in all of the literature. <laughs> I'm not quite sure about the, the history of it or how it came about to be, though. That's a great question. Yeah, the, it's interesting that the term fine Fine ceramics or fine wares is also used sometimes to apply to engineering and ceramics. Mm -hmm. um, I think in later periods of ceramics history, um, it's 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 missing from liter literature, uh, at least in my experience, to, to refer to things as as fine wares. So it's it's and that gets to another question I want to ask later, but I want to get to uh, the questions that have come in the Q&A. Elizabeth Schumacher from our seminar asks, what influenced you to pursue this specific area of ceramic history? Did someone introduce this to you? Did you take a class on it? Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Thank you. Yes, I was introduced to it by um, my amazing uh, supervisor, uh, Chris Jimski, who uh, 
He recently retired, but he was the chief curator of Egypt and Nubia at the Royal Ontario Museum and also professor in my department. And uh, he did excavations at uh, Meroe and he call, he brought uh, a lot of the material back to the Royal Ontario Museum. So I was actually able to work closely with Meroitic pottery. And honestly, it was uh, just, I was already very interested in ceramics. I had studied Islamic ceramics um, and, and Egyptian ceramics. Um, and then now I was kind of learning more about Nubia and Nubian ceramics. And when I found these gorgeous pieces of pottery, I kind of fell in love. And um, there's just so much that you can learn from, I mean, pottery from anywhere. You can learn so much um, about it. Like they're, they're indestructible to time and they are the most indestructible to time. And they really tell us a lot about, about the people that made them and, and, and more. Um, so I was very interested in Nubian history. Um, and I just really was fascinated by the Meroitic period. And um, I loved, I've loved Nubian pottery from the beginning. So once I found this, I guess it became my niche. I just, this is what I kind of kept going back to. So long-winded answer, but that's kind of how I decided to pursue doing a thesis on Meroitic pottery. And I'm never going back. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't go <be> back. <laughs> Liz's question brings up a question I wanted to ask you too regarding existing literature on this subject. So one theme that comes up in a seminar um, like this is the set of intersections between disciplines. So we're doing readings that are clearly from the archaeological perspective. We're doing art historical uh, readings, uh, craft theory readings, and uh, everything in between. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you could you teach us briefly about the, the existing literature on Meroitic ceramics and what gaps there are possibly in, in this history and, and any thoughts you have on art history analyses versus archaeological analyses? Mm -hmm. That's a great question because I studied not as an art historian, but as an archaeologist. So um, that's kind of like where my point of entry and my um, perspective comes from, archaeology. Um, so, I mean, speaking on the art historical analysis, I, I don't know if I could give a great uh, comparison only because I'm not um completely wary of art history uh the analytics of art history in that sense so i've i've studied um kind of the decorative approach to um Meroitic pottery which i guess constitutes art history in a way but it's it's heavily from the archaeological perspective um so that's one um in terms of gaps there's um, on Meroitic pottery, there's quite a bit of literature. Romain David, uh, he has been uh, writing some really great and doing really great excavating, uh, archaeological work um, on Meroitic pottery, which is why I really wanted you to read his, uh, his really great overview of Nubian or pottery being made in Nubia around this time. Um, so uh, the, the discipline for Meroitic pottery specifically, definitely needs a little bit of a refresh. Um, Adams um, was fa fabulous. I mean, he is the basis of the, the research that I use, um, but he was writing in the 60s. So like, uh, definitely we need to continue to do research on, um, as you mentioned, like who were the potters mm -hmm. and Kind of what else can we learn from this type, these types of potteries? And for me, like I'm looking at um, interregional transmission of ideas through the um, artistic approach on pottery. So um, I think that we're filling the gaps slowly, but <laughs> um, yeah, Meroitic pottery specifically, um, I feel like we could use more scholarship. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of scholarship on the Meroitic period. But the pottery specifically, I feel like um, it's 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 growing. It's it's mighty. There's a lot of great scholars, um, but 
yeah, I think it still has a lot of room to grow. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. We're so lucky to be learning about it from you. Thank you. Uh, a question from Professor of Ceramic Art, Matt Kelleher, who's joined us from sabbatical. Thank you, Matt, for attending today. Uh, he writes, looking at the cups and pouring vessels you showed, I am curious what liquids were consumed from them. Me too. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I'm not quite sure that they were used for consuming anything. Um, also, the, sometimes if you look at the interior of the vessel, they're not slipped, so they're porous. So uh, these, these, I would say, were very much like an exclusive type of good, kind of like a, 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 like ornament, like an ornamental. Um, and then also we find them as grave goods. So they're being acquired and then they're buried with individuals. So maybe not for actual use, like not being, not putting liquids in them, like they're being made for a specific reason um, with specific iconography and kind of used as ornament or um, however the individual wants to use it. But because we find them in such great quantities in, um, in cemeteries and royal and elite cemeteries, um, they're definitely being used as burial goods. Um, there are some types of meritic pottery that have been, I think, associated with uh, ritual. So we do find them at religious sites and broken in pieces. So um, there is a ceremony called the breaking of the pots, um, which uh, again, I'm not, uh, it's religion is not incredibly my uh, strong suit, but that is the, the Samaritan party has been um, associated with that ritual and also with religious sites. So being used in um, in religious spaces as well. Uh, that's fascinating. And, and, and that forms yet another example of so many that we've been talking about in the seminar of um, the existence of non-utilitarian ceramic vessels mm -hmm. well before the modernist moment and yeah. uh, well well and 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 it counters this uh modernist assumption that that uh non-utilitarian uh ceramic art uh, only began you know sometime in the early 20th century definitely not <laughs> definitely not <laughs> definitely not there were there were highly know. symbolic meanings for ceramic vessels that may or may not have have had corollaries to utilitary from really mm -hmm. the very beginning right from the very exactly from the very beginning <laughs> i've studied pottery from like 3500 bce um in egypt and in nubia and definitely like they're being used as ornament you know yeah <laughs> fascinating uh uh, Gabriel from the seminar writes, I was wondering what caused the widespread demand for Meroitic pottery? What caused the demand? Was it only a matter of production location in relation to trade routes or were Meroitic ceramics particularly sought after for the quality of craftsmanship or other reasons? I'm curious about this in relationship to the decline of quality accompanying mass production described in the reading. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe the de decline in quality, it, it goes hand in hand with um, the decline of the Meroitic polity. So as I mentioned, the, the pottery was highly centralized and most likely centralized through the state. So once the state started to collapse, I think the quality started to collapse. However, it didn't stop completely. Actually, a lot of the iconography and the same type of vessel shapes and um, uh, the potters, which kind of became itin itinerant um, after the collapse, still continued into the post meritic period. So um, yes, the, de the, the quality declined, but I think that I feel like that goes hand in hand because of kind of what the political situation was looking like. Um, at the time and how closely related like the, the ceramic production was with the political situation. Um, uh, and the demand, uh, because, because it's being funneled through elite spaces, 
um, I believe, and it's again, not the largest repertoire fine wares, um, that they were coveted as an exclusive good. Um, so that's how like, that's part of the demand. Um, but then also this is part of the state kind of, I guess, state propaganda of, um, of royal prestige and even imperial prestige like within the empire. So, and also pottery, as I mentioned, has been very consistent throughout Nubian history. Like they have been excellent um, and very uh, highly technical potters from prehistory. So I just find that um, that's one thing that I find completely amazing about uh, Nubian potters really from the beginning of their history, pottery has became, remained like a central um, form of artistic expression that has continued and continued even past the Meroitic period. Um, so I think that that is also where the demand comes from because it has become, it has remained so consistent throughout history. Thank you. Uh, we've got three more questions, which, which I think is is great for the uh, number of minutes we have left. I'm going to bundle two of these questions together because they follow up to topics that that you've already uh, been speaking about. Um, Julian from the seminar asks, is there any visual or textual evidence describing how the objects found around cemeteries and religious sites were used? And I think that's that's a question related to use within yeah. ritual uh mm -hmm. and then jane asks uh, jane is also from the seminar uh there's a large emphasis on production distribution and trade of meroitic ceramics um i think she means in in scholarship uh mm -hmm. is there research that shows technological advancements slash engineering and innovation of ceramics out of necessity so i'm going to bundle those could you <laughs> talk at all more about uh the context of ceramics use within funerary ritual and uh then if if we know if technologies of ceramics were coming about out of necessity either through um specific needs in ritual or or other uh other uses um okay let me which one do i answer first visual and text textual evidence um No, um, I'm thinking because I've also, as I said, studied the like, uh, Egyptian um, Egyptian uh, ceramics and boy, the Egyptians, they record everything. So <laughs> we have so much visual and textual evidence of everything. Um, but in the Meroitic period, we're still actually deciphering the Meroitic script, which oh, if, they, if we decipher it and there's information about pottery, I will cry. <laughs> um, so that would be fabulous. Um, but in terms of visual also, like, no, not for pottery production, which is interesting. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's more research to be done there. Um, and then technology. The other question, the other question was about um, uh, technological adva advancements related to uh, ceramics production. So, so you did you did speak about the uh, um, differences between coarse wares and and fine wares, and so presumably mm -hmm. uh, this is this is the major uh, you know uh, aspect of of technological differences within this history. Yes, and um, you know, I using the wheel allows for the. Um, I mean, actually, like they they perfected using the wheel to make these vessels either coarse or fine, but they also made really uh, in previous in previous uh, in previous periods they've made fine very very thin walled like wares like this with by hand as well so it's not to say that um like the technology 
that type of like technological skill, like by even making by hand with or the paddle and anvil, like without using the wheel, um, kind of disappeared into the Meroitic period. But allow using the wheel allows the the potters also to uh, create more. Um, I believe. Um, so my thoughts are all over the place. I'm trying to. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a big question. If I could maybe tack on a, a follow up question to that, you mentioned writing, and I wanted to ask you about uh, the development of writing. Also, um, if my source is correct, uh, Meroitic mm -hmm. writing appears in the second century BCE. So mm -hmm. um, this is this is corresponding to to this period of ceramics history we're talking about. Um, yeah. um, would you? Do you think there's any corollary between the decorative surface strategies we see here and the fact that writing is coming about at around the same time? Mm -hmm. would be pure conjecture and, you know, speculation. Um, I feel like, uh, to be honest, I feel like the, the empire or the, the kingdom was getting, you know, was doing well, was, um, like becoming more and more prosperous and I feel like whatever uh a civilization there is a like everything is uh is, is stable there's more opportunity to focus on on other things um and I've kind of seen this throughout history um just studying ancient history whenever there's like a really good period of stability then there's like a flourishing of artistic production or so um I feel like this may be kind of a product of that um, so during its heyday, during Meroitic Nubia's heyday, there's also like then development in writing because um, writing isn't very uh, common in Nubia, actually. Um, so the fact that this is happening during one of the most powerful periods um, in Nubian history, I, I think maybe it is not a coincidence. <laughs> ah, that's so interesting. OK, we have time for one more quick question and it's a really important one I think uh, from one of our ceramic art professors Adira Willard do you make pottery or work with contemporary potters to help aid in your research of this work <laughs> um yes so I mean I'm not a really I'm not a very good potter but I do I do uh wheel throw and hand build <laughs> and uh if I could if I could perfect my my pottery making skills that would be great but I'm not, I'm not a very good potter at all but definitely it it kind of helps ground me in what I'm doing and helps me understand what I'm doing um I also am a, a big fan of contemporary potters I haven't worked closely with any of them but uh yes I do keep up and and look at works by contemporary artists who are potters and um yeah so that kind of helps me helps ground myself, helps me understand more. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, a great question to end on as it brings us to the present day. <laughs> That's all we have time for today. I knew it was going to fly by because you shared with us so many fascinating vessels and contextualized them uh, in, in such important ways. Thanks for joining us all the way from London. <laughs> this afternoon okay. where you are today. Thanks to all of you for attending, for posing your great questions. We're going to host another guest lecture November 2nd at this same time. Uh, the speaker then is Diana Yang, a Bard Graduate Center doctoral candidate. She'll be speaking about her research on Chinese Zhangzhou ware. So thank you, Anissa. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you.